in chapter 7, and everyone went to his own house. There's been confusion. Christ has been teaching. It's during the, the time of the Feast of Tabernacles, and so there's a crowd there. The Lord's in the temple area, and again, he's speaking, and he's teaching, and, and he's preaching. But there's a religious community there, and they're confused. They're confused over who Jesus Christ is and what his mission is. Now, there's people coming to the saving knowledge of Christ. If you look at verse 31 in, or in chapter 7, it says, And many of the people believed in him and said, When the Christ comes, will he do more signs than these which this man has done? The Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring. They were concerning or considering who Christ is. It says, considering these things, or considering him. And the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. They were going to arrest him at that time. But it's during that that Jesus spoke of a very profound truth here, especially to the religious committee that he's going to highlight in chapter 8. So again, in chapter 7, looking at verses 33 and 34, that Jesus said to them, I shall be with you a little longer, and then I go to him who sent me. You will seek me and not find me, and where I am, you cannot come. Now he's speaking of the future. There's going to come the time when they see the truth that Jesus Christ truly was their Lord and Savior. And there's going to be many people, even that will be during our time, even acquaintances of ours, that, well, they're going to seek him, but it's going to be too late. There was that picture of the rich man, Lazarus, back in Luke chapter 16. And this man saw the reality, the judgment that he was facing at this time. In verse 29 of Luke chapter 16, it says, And Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to them, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, but one rise from the dead. And we saw that this is those who depend upon Abraham even for their salvation. The Jew depended upon the reality that they were Jews and sin, that they were right with God just simply because of that. But that wasn't the purpose of God's word. God's word should have pointed to the fact that they were sinners and they were in need of a savior. It's the definite purpose of the law. But here we come back to Christ, and we're going to see that perfect balance between the Lord Jesus Christ and His love and grace for humanity versus the law and the purpose of the law. In Jeremiah 29, 11, now keeping in mind, as I pointed out before, this verse was given while Israel was in Judah, was in Babylonian captivity. And so I would imagine if you were taken off into Babylonian captivity and you heard that city had been sacked and the temple destroyed, you would wonder, well, how does all this fit together? God ha has forsaken us, and what about all of his promises? It would probably bring a lot of doubt into your mind. Now, there would be the reality that you were deserving of the judgment, your predicament that you were in, but God, through the prophet, meets them in a very real way. In Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Now when he says, I know God speaking through the prophet, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, because the people were wondering, what are the thoughts that God thinks towards us? But God is revealing his mind, his heart towards them. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you a future and a hope. Hope, trusting in God for the future. God gives us that future and the hope. You see the things that are going on. You see the things as we turn on the TV, as we turn on the internet and pick up a newspaper and the evil that goes on throughout the world that just seems like they're intensifying and multiplying. But God still says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Thoughts of peace and not evil to give you a future and a hope. That's what I planned back then when things seemed to be so dark. And I would imagine, when you're sitting there in Babylonian captivity, you're thinking that, that, that God no longer has peace. When you act, this seems to be so evil and contrary to God's word. But I can feel the same way. You can feel the same way as you're going through trials and trouble and testing it. So that sounds so overwhelming 
But we see the loving kindness of God. We see God's grace in the midst of this. Because there's not a Jew that was deserving during that time, Jeremiah, deserving of that future and the hope. But nonetheless, God still gives us that future and the hope. And so last week we closed with the nature of the priests, Sadducees, and the Pharisees, those representing God to man who should have been well aware of so much, but we see the confusion that existed at the end of chapter 7. It says, the officers came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, why have you not brought them? Again, they sent these men to arrest Christ because they were going to put him to death. And the officers answered, no man ever spoke like this man. And so we've got to keep that kind of in the back of our mind tonight. Because what are they hearing? They've been hearing the words of the law and judgment, law and judgment, but now they're hearing these words of grace, and it's just an amazement to them. The officers answered, No man ever spoke like this man, verse 47. Then the Pharisees answered them, Are you also deceived? Well, we know the reality. No, they have deceived themselves. Verse 48, have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is a curse. Well, their question is almost asked immediately, because here is Nicodemus. That's Nicodemus from John chapter 3. Men came to Moses here. Nicodemus, he who came to Jesus by night, being one of them, said to them, Does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he's doing? So what's Nicodemus doing here? He's speaking truth from the word of God. But they answered and said to him, Are you also from Galilee? Search a book, for no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. Well, that's not true. The prophet Jonah came from Galilee. So we see their ignorance, and their ignorance, I'm sure they're well versed in the traditions of man, but the problem is their ignorance rested in the Word of God. If your ignorance rests in the Word of God, you're never going to truly understand the grace of God. When my days of ignorance were upon me, I always thought that God was mad. God was mad and was even almost looking to judge me. But I had an improper perspective of who God is. Why? Because it was presented to me through traditions and the religions of man and not the truth of God. But there came that time as I sat and studied and realized the grace of God. And, and that's why it's the goodness of God that led me to repentance. I understood through the teaching of God's word that, yeah, I'm a sinner. But Christ came and he, he died for sinners. He became and he died for me. It was that goodness that brought me to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the heart of religion is self-righteous judgment apart from humble self-examination. And that's where the Lord is going to meet them right now. He's going to rock them to their very foundation because we see where religion has brought them back then. There was no big thing to them to stone this woman who was caught in adultery. Let me read the scriptures. Verse uh, 1 of chapter 8. Jesus points to the Mount of Olives. Now the Mount of Olives is just right across from the temple. You can walk there probably in 20 minutes or so. Now early in the morning he came again into the temple and all people came to him and he sat down and talked to them. So this was a a, a daily routine, something he was doing during this Feast of Tabernacles. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him the woman caught in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his fingers as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one, and he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of you? As no one condemned you, she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And so once again, to that intellect of the religious community, it was no big deal to sacrifice the life of this woman. 
we see where religion, extreme religion, even, has taken man. If you look at the world scene today, you look at the ISIS issue, you look at people even in our country, and you see just the destruction that it's able to cause. Not so much a physical death, but definitely a spiritual death. Pastor, I get to hear a lot of stories and a lot of people's backgrounds, and a lot of people were done some serious damage in what was supposedly the church. And you see the destruction that legalism caused. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 18, verse 6, But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Do you hear that? Can you imagine? Imagine having a millstone, it probably weighed a couple hundred pounds, and to have it thrown in the water and the rope around your neck. Can you imagine your thoughts going down your final thoughts and just how horrible that must be? Well, this is God speaking that, and so you need to see the intensity of this heart here. And you need to see how important just even, but one of these little ones, he's probably speaking along, he's not speaking so much of the child, he's using that as an illustration, but he's speaking of the less mature. And really what he's speaking of, Christian, is you're sitting here today, especially of us have been in church a lot, or maybe know a lot, well versed in the scriptures and all. He's speaking of those people who are less versed in the scriptures than you, and really what he's speaking of people who you are able to do great spiritual damage to. And so we've got to consider those things. We're ministering to one another, even in our common conversation as we're out there in the fellowship area. I've got potential. I've got great potential with the Word of God to see a life change, to see somebody encouraged in the relationship with Christ. But also there's great potential to do such, to do such horrible damage. We need to see, we need to look at ourselves. How do we conduct ourselves in the house of God? Make that judgment, make that self-examination, because, well, we need to consider it serious simply because the Lord considers it serious. And so the heart of the scribes and Pharisees now is to trap Jesus and to expose him as the fraud they believe him to be, and reveal themselves to be the spiritual superiors that they believe themselves to be. But they weren't even willing to go and do that which they had commanded previously, what I read in verse 45, those officers do. They were willing to take them. Those guys didn't take them. They were going to go out and do the deed themselves, but they weren't bold. Now, if it's truth, you're bold in the truth. And if Jesus was a blasphemer or whatever, they wanted to speak against blasphemy, and they should have been bold enough. They should have done the work themselves. But the problem is they were never willing to do this deed, the crucifixion or the killing of Christ themselves. Now here, what they're trying to do is they're trying to discredit him in the eyes of the people so that when they do take him and when they do kill him, then it will be justified or probably even just wouldn't be that big of a deal to the people. They want to place Jesus now through this little test here in the position of reconciling his teaching of love, grace, and repentance with the law of God. If Jesus just lets this woman go, then he's got a problem. There's a real dilemma. If he just lets him go, then he's contrary to the law of Moses. He's contrary to the word of God. If he has her stone, then he's contrary to his own doctrines, his own teachings. Again, he'll be discredited either way. And people, so they feel that they have pretty much a foolproof plan here. With Jesus, as well as us, grace is only grace when a situation dictates hate, judgment, or some sort of penalty. And this woman is guilty. There's no doubt about it. Matter of fact, if this one is not guilty of adultery, then this whole story makes absolutely no sense at all. But she is. The fact of the matter is we have to understand that she is guilty of adultery. <clears throat> How are you when you have something similar? Are you a stone thrower? Or are you a grace giver? You see what happened last Sunday morning, Saturday night, at the bar back in Orlando? I can think of a hundred reasons why they I can think of a million things to say contrary to those people and how deserving of death they were. But then I remember I was deserving of death. And I got grace. And remember what grace is? Grace is that which I didn't deserve. 
is the same thing. Don't think any of us are any special, really any different. Now, we're children of God. There's no doubt about us, us who have received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But nonetheless, just as they went, we could have gone as well. But just by the grace of God, the goodness of God led us to repentance. Now, how did the goodness of God lead you to repentance? Somebody ministered to you. Somebody ministered to me. Somebody shared God's word with me, shared God's love so that I would understand the grace of God. It's not perishing. There's people partying, eating, drinking, partying for tomorrow we die. Sometimes that's true. Sometimes that's true. We need to continue on before teaching them and telling them about the Lord Jesus Christ. On Facebook, there's this little video. There's a little video about everything, but this particular little video was uh, Charlie Rose and Bill Meyer. We have seen it. It kind of goes around. It's like it's a lot. Um, Bill Meyer is, I, I think he can himself an atheist. I'm not real sure about that. Charlie Rose, I don't think he's a believer. He just does not put that forth. I enjoy what he does. He's an excellent interviewer. But he's interviewing Bill Maher. Bill Maher is speaking against Islam and telling him, you know, the reality and the things that he was speaking for. He says, you know, he says, you could look at Islam and almost on every page of the Quran, you're killing people, you're subjecting women to the submission to the will of the men, and he's just going down this list. He says, you know, I've discovered Christianity isn't anything like that. And Charlie starts arguing, every time he starts an argument, he puts it down. And I'm just thinking, here we got an unbeliever. An unbeliever is going there and he's standing, he doesn't understand what he's doing, but he's standing for the truth of God. And I look at that, man, this guy is willing to stand boldly for that which he doesn't understand. He has an experience. What about us? I can speak from life experience. Are we bold and given the opportunity? Because lives depend upon it. Lives depend upon it. It was kind of a cool witness with Chick-fil-A. Those who came up against them, they went and ministered to. I mean, you know, they're just like, you know, no, it's a Christian organization. They close on Sunday. The idea of the people going to church, that Sunday morning they went out. And I don't know if they feed the first responders or the people. I don't remember who, but they made the presence known, and they did that work of, of ministry. And these things speak towards the goodness of God, towards those who don't deserve it. Chick-fil-A could have cast a stone. Instead, they came and they ministered to people where they're at. You can say you're gracious, but we'll only find that out when you're challenged by a trying situation. What we have here is this religion wanting to prove that it is right at the expense of somebody's life. Jesus is going to prove what is right at the expense of his life. See, if these people as Americans, we've got precious rights. People have died for them. My, my uncle was one of the first people, he didn't get killed in the World War II, but he was one of the first people in the death camps. He experienced a lot of stuff. I saw my son-in-law as he was deployed to Afghanistan, I was in Afghanistan twice. I, I saw the separation from his family and the hardship. So people, don't get me wrong on this, I love the rights that we have in this country. But what's more important than the rights that we have is what is right to do. And we have a book that is filled with what is right to do, and what is right to do supersedes the rights. And what I'm saying is, sometimes I may have to give up some of my rights for that which is right to do. And so we have here, yes, if she was caught in a very act of adultery, you've got the right to stone her. But is that the right thing to do? <coughs> Excuse me. Is this one that's got the intent of the law? Again, verses 1 and 2, that Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early morning he came again to the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down. He talked about self-righteous need an opportunity here to put their plan in action. You see the sheep, I would imagine some of these people, the people that we saw previously in chapter 7, were coming to Christ, surrendering their lives to Christ. And so he was teaching, he was doing the next thing, he was evangelizing before, he's instructing them, he's raising them up, he's discipling them. And again, keeping in mind that one statement that I said earlier, no man ever spoke like this man. Not understanding exactly who Christ is, but I would imagine just from the words of the Lord, he would probably come back the next day if he knew he was there. It was just something special about the words that this man spoke. Verses 3 through 5. <clears throat> then the uh, scribes and Pharisees 
brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when he had sat there in the midst, they were examining this woman. They said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses and the law commanded us that such and stone. But what do you say? Now between Jesus, the Pharisees, and the woman, there seems to be this one undeniable fact. And again, just God make this point. She committed adultery. They caught her, they caught her in the very act. And it's even possible, I can't remember who it was, James Montgomery voice, but I, I, it kind of grasped me, there is, but it's definitely something that could possibly be true. Adam and Eve, they were in the garden, and they said, what did they realize? They realized they're naked. And, and the idea is, now that they're sitting, the shame is wide open to anybody and everybody, especially to the Lord. Jesus Christ, it was said, contrary to the pictures and statues that we have, when the Lord was hung upon the cross, he was hung naked. It was a common practice. The person got healed was this wide open shame to everybody. And it's very possible, it's going to be brought up the possibility. Since this woman was just caught, caught in the very act, she was probably going around for everybody to make it. And so the point being, she's very vulnerable at this time. All of her shame is open to everybody. What if, what if I told you, God spoke to me last night? No, this is just a what if. God spoke to me last night, and uh, I don't want to even say a name because many of I'm talking about you and I'm not talking about anybody, but he gave me a list of, of, of uh, uh, Eunice. No, I don't think anybody here named Eunice. Okay. He gave me a list of all of Eunice's sins. She's going to be there on Thursday night and I want you to project them on the screen. It'd probably be a pretty long list. It'd be a pretty long list from all of us. And we'll do sin after sin after sin after sin after sin after sin. Now we wouldn't have enough time for such a thing, so we'll just say we hit the highlights. Eunice would be sitting there naked before everybody. To hold on, but she's sitting there naked before everybody. All of her shame now has been exposed. And so that's the idea, and that's the magnitude of what is happening here. This woman is helpless, and she is at the mercy of the people who are around her. Praise God, Jesus is in the midst of them. And sometimes you are going to be Christ's representative in the midst of those who would do damage to somebody's life. We need to be mindful of that. And so this woman is everybody who is imperfect, who has spiritually failed, has fallen short of perfection, has not met man's or God's standard for what is right or moral. In the context of this event, guilt seems to be, not seems to be, but guilt is a given. If you look around the church, though, through the eyes of wickedness, you would see the sins that exist here tonight. You would look around the church through the eyes of Jesus, whose grace personified. Because I use myself as an example. You can bring anyone. The Bible says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Turn over to Romans chapter 3. I'm sorry, Romans chapter 2. Paul brings up the concept, the possibility of getting into heaven according to our works. Now, let me read this, and I'll kind of expound on it. I mean, he, he's working towards Romans chapter 3, so keep that in the back of your mind. But in Romans chapter 2, verses 6 through 10, speaking of God, who will bring each one according to his deeds. So God is going to judge us according to his deeds. Eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. And the idea is, these are people, if you look at the verse, these are people who are as good as God all the time. When he uses that word good there, the standard for good in that, that, that Greek word is God. And so the idea of the people who are as good as God and all the time, well, they, the eternal life for those people, verse 8, but to those who are self-seeking, and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish on every soul of man who does evil of the Jew first and also of the Greek. But what honor and peace to everyone who works what is good to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now he says to everyone who does that. 
But really what he's doing is he's setting up. He's setting mankind up. Because here, he's just kind of lulling them. Because some people are say, why do that? But what he's doing is he's lulling them into the coffin. And then you enter into chapter 3. And he just starts hammering nail after nail after nail on the lid of the coffin of mankind. Now he says everyone is as good as God and as good as God all the time. And for the people who are thinking that maybe that is them, he says here in chapter 3, verse 10, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is no one who understands. There is none who seeks or searches after God. They have all turned aside and have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. The idea is continually does good. So that, that kind of throws that out. No, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. So their heart is being revealed. The universe is being revealed. With their tongues, they have practiced deceit. The poisons of asps is upon their lips. His mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. In the way of peace they have not known, for there is no fear of God before their eyes. This is a perfect description of the people apart from Christ who are standing and accusing that woman. This is a perfect example of the religious community that wants to stone this woman to death. Now again, in verse 5, now Moses and the law, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm back in John chapter 8. Verse 5, now Moses and the law commanded us that such, wouldn't even call her a name, wouldn't even refer to her as a person, that such, and you can see the separation that they put between themselves and this woman, that such should be stoned. But well, what do you say? Leviticus 20.10 the man who commits adultery with another man's wife, he who commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Well, they are technically speaking the truth here, but there's a couple of problems. First, this situation would demand multiple witnesses. The death penalty would very rarely be brought to pass because it would be void, you know, the outlaw, but there would need to be at least two or more eyewitnesses to the very act. And they thought they had Christ here because apparently they did have eyewitnesses. But again, the second problem would be in public for this before, but where is the man? Because the, the, the bit I just read you, it says that both this woman and the man caught in adultery are to be put to death. Now, if you catch them in the very act, they're both there. But the problem is they held the woman off, but they left the man. So again, we know, because we've just been told this, that this has been a setup. So the man was part of the plan. And so God wants the reader to know, going in, that this setup is in order to test Jesus. Now, this isn't just a situation, this is something they fostered, entrapment, or whatever it might be. It's all it's doing is bringing simple nature both them and this woman to the forefront, and Christ is going to deal with it. But man set up to test God, his opportunity, though, to teach truth about the nature of God in it. He wants us to know that the self-righteous are just as guilty before God as this adulterer. So just as she's guilty beyond a doubt, they're just, they're just as deserving of death as she is. Matter of fact, we all stand before holy God, guilty, apart from the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, keep in mind, what are they doing? What's their mindset? Their bottom line is they're trying to kill off the Christ. If they effectively, if they were able to kill off the Christ, then all of humanity is dead. All of humanity is headed for destruction. All of humanity is headed to judgment. Now the nature of law is judgment. And now we, just as God, God is created us in his image. Now we have this heart for justice. We have a heart for, again, what we believe our, our rights are and the right thing to come to pass. I was in Costco not too long ago. I was buying food for the couple somewhere that we have. There was a lady in front of me that was going pretty slow. The line was long. It was quite deep. Actually, it was the lady, there was somebody else, and myself, and then the bomb line behind me. You know, Costco, you carry around a semi basket, a semi truck basket, and it's from a high school, too. This lady was pretty full, and I'm looking at her, and you know, I said, you know, 
wants to do. I'm looking at her stuff with a mosey. And uh, yeah, she's got junk. I'm thinking, you know, here's this older lady. She's eating all that junk. And um, so she goes through and checks out. And then she pulls out a EDM card. Is that what it's called? A food stamp card? But anyway, they said in food stamps, they give you a card. So that you can do that. Um, I had heard a couple of snide comments from the people behind me. Um, and it's not right that you buy, she buys all that stuff on that kind of card. <laughs> And so, you know, let's put it in the company car. And so, her checking her out, and she's finished checking out. She swipes the card, I'm sorry, you're short, 19, whatever, 20 bucks. And oh, and then her sneaker. I wonder what she's going to, I wonder what she's going to give up. But with somebody in that line that lifted up the 20, that was, that was a really neat thing. And that paid for her because, well, yeah, I could go for every item in there. Her best. And you know, if she's on getting money from the government, she has no right to be buying this and no right to be buying that. And we can still get into that mindset. But that lady, you know, it, it was a cool thing to do. It was kind of funny that, she, you know, she, she was kind of confused at first, and, and the cashier says, Well, that person's going to take care of it. And, and the lady kind of just looked around at her stuff and laughed, never even said thank you. And uh, the cashier says, well, I just want to thank you for that. And the person said, you know, it's all right. You can just see the heart. You can see the heart. The heart is that we strictly want to judge. And we have to get over that. We have to be the mindset. I, I, I look at this cart. I don't deserve anything in this cart. I look at the, the car that I brought the cart out to, the truck that I have. I don't deserve that. I look at the home that I go to, I look at the health that I have, I look at the family that I've got. There's not a thing there that I deserve. And matter of fact, if you want to be nitpicky as you can so easily be with somebody like that lady, somebody could look at me and I'm twice as guilty as I know her to be or what I believe her to be. And so we've got to be the mindset of how we look at people and get rid of those old ways in our lives because God's not mad. God is gracious and so love the world. And he wants us to be witnesses of that love into this world. And so we have this back to chapter 8, this defining moment in Jesus' ministry. This woman's life is at stake. The validity of Jesus' teachings are at stake. And the purpose of the law is at stake. Because Christ can't just throw out the law because, as we know, that's the word of God. And so he's got to do one of two things, really. He's either got to compromise one way or the other, but either way he does damage. Or he can do what he does. He can do what he does because what he does is the revelation of his nature in the light of the law was given for. And when we see the reality of these truths as they come together, and what do these truths come together and and, and what do they really give? They give life. They give life to those who are deserving of death. So first thing the Lord does is he deals with the self-righteous here, verses 6 to 9. This they said, testing him, so this is a test, that they might have something which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped on the ground and wrote on the ground with his fingers as though he did not hear it. And when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to him, Who is without sin among you? Let him throw the first stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Now, there's a million opinions about what the Lord wrote. Some people say when he first stooped down on the ground, he was writing names. And he wrote all of those, the self-righteous people's names down there. And then the second time, he started filling the sin next to them. And that, that's all fine and dandy. Maybe that's exactly what he did. I don't know. But I do know that the words of Christ are revealing and they cut to the heart and they expose and they expose who we are and see how effective it is. No, notice it didn't say anything about somebody turning and say, hey, I know you did that. It wasn't that kind of a thing. It was a personal thing. It was personal heart surgery that exposed the heart to the individual to such a degree as they're looking at themselves and they're seeing these things Probably things that they were hiding behind fig leaves and bushes, if you will, that the only thing they could do would be to drop their head and walk away. And again, we can never 
never forget the effective use of the law to remember the sins of work. Now, we still sin without a doubt, and now you can justify God looks at you just as if you have never sinned. If you want to be self-righteous, you're holding on to your own righteousness, but I'd rather go to the righteousness of this Christ, because it's the righteousness of Christ that not only comes to sin, but does away with my sin as if it had never existed. When I was part of the Catholic Church, you were required to go to confession. I don't remember how often I'd go to my parents, either brought me or made me go. And I remember sitting in the pews or waiting like my turn to go up there and thinking, okay, what did I do? And it's not that I couldn't think of what I did, but what you do, you kind of put out of your mind. And so I kind of make a list. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It has been three weeks since my last confession. These are my sins. And okay, I lied three times, I stole twice, I lusted, I did this, and I did that. And you need to tell you, okay, go we'll see five Hail Marys and three are fathers, and, and then you're, I guess, you're, you're washed clean or, or whatever it might be. But I was never completely clean. I was soiled, I was Holy Spirit. There was always that personal conviction in my life as I knew me down who I was. And even though I would have that little list of sins, that was just covering I would never expose the problem even to myself. It's a deep down inside. And that being the case, I was never really right with God. When you're not right with God, you know you're not right with God. And so what are the Sadducees and Pharisees? They're putting on this ultra self-righteousness because they know the depth of the depravity of the heart. And now the problem with Christ is he's exposing it all. And really, as Jesus is writing in that soil, in essence, he's really signing his own death certificate. I mean, I know that, you know, this was the Father's will, the cross of the Father's will, without a doubt. But this man knows. And when somebody knows, they've got to go. And so they're being exposed because they've worked so hard to cover, but now everybody is seeing them for who they are. It's very possible that he just simply wrote the law as well. Maybe he wrote all three of people's names, the sins, and the law. I don't know because if you look, regardless of what any good idea that anybody comes up with, the fact of the matter is we're not told what he wrote, but what he wrote convicted them to their very core. He was chapter 4, verse 12. Whatever he wrote, I guarantee you this, I'll tell you exactly what he wrote around. He wrote the words of God. Because he's God, and he's writing words on the ground. And again, nobody ever taught as this man did. For the people getting saved, it was, it was glorious. For these people, it was something completely opposite. Hebrews 14, 12, the word of God is living and powerful. Well, that's what they're being presented with. And sharper than any twitch disorder, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and the intent of the heart. What's the intent of their heart? Their intent of the heart is to sacrifice this woman in order to capture Christ. And now it's all been, it's as somebody opened up their chest with a scalpel and it's all, the heart is spilled all over the place and it's a pretty ugly thing. Romans chapter three, verses 19 through 20, if you've been with us any, any length of time, I, it's one of my favorite verses, and one of the profound verses in my life. But we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, well, that's these people, that every mouth may be stopped. That's no excuse before God. And all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified. No flesh will be seen as if they never sinned. Matter of fact, all flesh will be seen as they are sinners. For by the law is simply the knowledge of sin. And so... There's only one thing that these guys could have done. They didn't do it. Verse 9. And those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. Now I say there's only one thing to do. That's not true. There's two things they did. The first thing they did is laugh. But see, the thing about it is you look at them doing kind of a semi-noble thing. You have to see their sins, okay, they're not going to stone them and walk away. But where did they walk away to? They walked away into outer darkness. They could have repented. People were doing that earlier. 
So they, they could have repented. They had this opportunity to get right with Christ. And they didn't do it. They walked away. And it's the heartbreaking thing of sharing your faith when you see those people, especially the people who are so close, so close to coming to Christ, but just never really were able to cross that threshold into a into surrendering their lives to Lord. And as you see that they walk away, where are they walking away to? I think it's left open in because we don't know. The which I'm going says he went away. Where did he go? Did he come into the saving knowledge of Christ at some point in his life? We just don't know. And it's a heartbreaking thing to share your faith. You don't always get to know. Matter of fact, rarely. If you share your faith, rarely will you get to know. I remember I had somebody that sat in our church after we started the church, and they sat Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, and then they went away. And I always wondered, whatever happened to them, one day they came back, where would you go? You're going to love this. Yeah, I, I left the church and I didn't leave the church. I, was, I went to another church one Sunday because of whatever reason there, and I got saved. And what was wrong with our church? <laughs> but the, the point here is, you know, we, so there, there are victories from sharing God's word. There, there's the fulfillment of those seeds, the joy of the life and salvation springs up. But then again, there are, are those, and there will always be those who go into outer darkness. But the fact of the matter is, their mouths were stopped. They have become guilty before God because their sinful nature has been exposed. And all of their self-righteousness, now they realize, which the other people do, is nothing but filthy rags. It's nothing but a very unclean thing. Again, John chapter 7, this time verse 46. No man ever spoke like this man. Verses 10, 11. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but one, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go in and sin no more. He's given grace. And you can say, Well, how can he not understand that and how on this but how can he just give grace in the face of of adultery. How, how can he just allow, I mean, isn't that, that's one of the top ten here. How, how can he just give grace? Well, the more serious the sin, the greater grace is going to be seen. And the fact of the matter was, this was not this woman's day of judgment. And I can relate to that. God kept me through quite a bit of foolishness and stupidness in my life. Times that I could have died. Times I could enter into eternity apart from God, but He kept me for that day of salvation. Did she go away saved? I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. But what He tells her to do is, and this is to sin no more. He says, leave a life of practicing sin and turn to a life of godliness. Not for salvation, but because of a right relationship with Christ. That lady was not going to go and just never sin, but I, I really think there's some portents here of doing what is necessary to have that right relationship with God. Go and sin no more. Now, the only way that I can go and sin no more is to come in here guilty for God, not being covered by the righteousness of God, and then to be covered by the righteous of God. To go and to examine the scriptures, or have somebody examine them and, and teach them to me, and to see what's necessary for a right relationship with Jesus Christ, and obtain that right relationship with Jesus Christ through faith. And it's then that I'm able, at that point, to go and to sin no more. At least in the eyes of God. Not that I'm not going to commit a sin, but again, God looks at me just as if I never sinned. I was hoping young Max the other day Max was, at that time, he was probably about four or five hours old. I wasn't really thinking this at the time, but Max the dirty sin. Max is an unclean thing. Now, I believe in an age of accountability. If I'm taking, I believe he's taking one to himself. But at some point, Max is going to need to receive Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. There needs to be that change that Jesus talked about in John chapter 3 with Nicodemus. Even though Max was born on Monday, at some point in his life, he will need to be born again. Self-righteous wanted to live by the law. What happened? They went away condemned. 
this lady who is as guilty as all get out, she's the one who experienced grace. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Well, I'll, I'll close from there. You can go ahead and close your Bibles just go ahead and listen. The Apostle Paul in chapter 7 of the book of Romans, he's going through the dilemma. Now, again, remember when I taught this, it's a hard section of scripture to, to teach, but it's very easy, relatable. It's very relatable. He says in verse 14 of Romans chapter 7, We know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. But for to will is present with me, but to have to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it's longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that is evil, that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inner man, but I see another law of my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity. It's a law of sin which is in my members. So I mean to sit there and to explain that out in detail is kind of a difficult thing. But I imagine everybody here relates to that. I so want to live a godly life. That's my desire. But I so fail to do that. I don't want to sin. I don't want to go back and whatever it might be, but I find myself going back there. And so what Paul is talking about is that great dilemma that we all struggle with. But then he comes to chapter 8, that great conclusion. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. For those who are in Christ. Now, it doesn't just stop there. It says, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit, who are of the mindset to go and to sin no more. We know that when we do sin, we have an advocate. That's Christ who washes all of our sins away. It's not about me being perfect. That's why they were perfect. They walked into outer darkness. The woman who sinned was mute all to see. She, she went away that day experiencing the grace of God. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for these rich pictures that you give us. Imperfect people who felt time and time again. But Father, again, we received grace. And sometimes, Lord, as we look down our nose at other people, I pray, Father, that you would show us, that we would see that in actuality we are either, we would have been, apart from you, worse than they are. And so, Father, help us to be people that discern everything that we do, all the ministry that we produce through your wonderful grace. And so, Father, we just thank you tonight for this opportunity to be here, to dig into your word, Father, that you would bless us for doing so, that you will continue to speak to us and guide us into opportunities, Father, for sharing this love. And, Father, we would truly be vessels of your grace, sharing it to this dying world. And so, Father, as we saw again that example in Orlando, that little boy taken by that alligator in Florida, that life is so precious and it can end so suddenly, may we truly be reminded that time is of the essence. And so, Father, I pray that we would be people found faithful to your glory, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. We all stand with us. Before Bob closes us with one last song, just keep in mind tomorrow night we're having our prayer meeting Saturday, or not Saturday, morning, Friday. What's the day after Saturday? Sunday, that's it. Sunday, we are having a Father's Day message, and then Sunday night, we're taking Sunday night. Bob, don't come to church on Sunday night. Got it? Okay, very good. Have a good night.